Welcome back to Classic Stories and Fairy Tales. I'm your host and narrator, Jerry Coble, and we are continuing in the book, The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. And today we will be reading Chapter 7, Agricultural Experience. I had now been in this unhappy island above ten months. All possibility of deliverance from this condition seemed to be entirely taken from me, and I firmly believed that no human shape had ever set foot upon that place. Having now secured my habitation, as I thought fully to my mind, I had a great desire to make a more perfect discovery of the island, and to see what other productions I might find which I yet knew nothing of. It was on the 15th of July that I began to take a more particular survey of the island itself. I went up the creek first, where, as I hinted, I brought my rafts on shore. I found after I came about two miles up that the tide did not flow any higher, and that it was no more than a little brook of running water, very fresh and good. But, this being the dry season, there was hardly any water in some parts of it, at least not enough to run in any stream, so as it could be perceived. On the banks of this brook, I found many pleasant savannas or meadows, plain, smooth, and covered with grass, and on the rising parts of them, next to the higher grounds, where the water, as might be supposed, never overflowed, I found a great deal of tobacco, green, and growing to a great and very strong stock. There were diverse other plants, which I had no notion of or understanding about, that might, perhaps, have virtues of their own, which I could not find out. I searched for the cassava root, which the Indians, in all that climate, make their bread of, but I could find none. I saw large plants of aloes, but did not understand them. I saw several sugar canes, but wild, and, for want of cultivation, imperfect. I contested myself with these discoveries for this time, and came back musing with myself what course I might take to know the virtue and goodness of any of the fruits or plants which I should discover, but could bring it to no conclusion. For, in short, I had made so little observation while I was in the Brazils that I knew little of the plants in the field, at least very little that might serve to any purpose now in my distress. The next day, the 16th, I went up the same way again, and after going something further than I had gone the day before, I found the brook and the savannah cease, and the country become more woody than before. In this part I found different fruits, and particularly I found melons upon the ground, in great abundance, and grapes upon the trees, the vines had spread, indeed, over the trees, and the clusters of grapes were just now in their prime, very ripe and rich. This was a surprising discovery, and I was exceedingly glad of them, but I was warned by my experience to eat sparingly of them, remembering that when I was ashore in Barbary, the eating of the grapes killed several of our Englishmen, who were slaves there, by throwing them into fluxes and fevers but I found an excellent use for these grapes, and that was to cure or dry them in the sun, and keep them as dried grapes or raisins are kept, which I thought would be, as indeed they were, wholesome and agreeable to eat when no grapes could be had. I spent all that evening there, and went not back to my habitation, which, by the way, was the first night, as I may say, I had lain from home. In the night, I took my first contrivance and got up in a tree, where I slept well, and the next morning proceeded upon my discovery. Traveling nearly four miles, as I might judge by the length of the valley, keeping still due north, with a ridge of hills on the south and north side of me. At the end of this march I came to an opening where the country seemed to descend to the west, and a little spring of fresh water, which issued out of the side of the hill by me, ran the other way that is, due east, and the country appeared so fresh, so green, so flourishing, everything being in a constant verdure or flourish of spring that it looked like a planted garden. I descended a little on the side of that delicious vale, surveying it with a secret kind of pleasure, 
though mixed with my other afflicting thoughts, to think that this was all my own, that I was the king and lord of all this country indefensibly, and had a right of possession, and if I could convey it, I might have it in inheritance as completely as any lord of a manor in England. I saw here abundance of cocoa trees, orange and lemon and citron trees, but all wild and very few bearing any fruit, at least not then. However, the green limes that I gathered were not only pleasant to eat, but very wholesome, and I mixed their juice afterwards with water, which made it very wholesome and very cool and refreshing. I found now I had business enough to gather and carry home, and I resolved to lay up a store as well of grapes and limes and lemons to furnish myself for the wet season, which I knew was approaching. In order to do this, I gathered a great heap of grapes in one place, a lesser heap in another place, and a great parcel of limes and lemons in another place. And, taking a few of each with me, I traveled homewards, resolving to come again and bring a bag or sack, or what I could make, to carry the rest home. Accordingly, having spent three days on this journey, I came home, so I must now call my tent and my cave. But before I got thither, the grapes were spoiled, the richness of the fruit and the weight of the juice having broken them and bruised them. They were good for little or nothing." As to the limes, they were good, but I could bring but a few. The next day, being the 19th, I went back, having made me two small bags to bring home my harvest. But I was surprised when coming to my heap of grapes, which were so rich and fine when I gathered them, to find them all spread about, trod to pieces, and dragged about, some here, some there, and an abundance eaten and devoured. By this I concluded there were some wild creatures thereabouts which had done this, but what they wore I knew not. However, as I found there was no laying them up on heaps and no carrying them away in a sack, but that one day they would be destroyed and the other way they would be crushed with their own weight, I took another course, for I gathered a large quantity of the grapes and hung upon the out branches of the trees that they might cure and dry in the sun. And as for the limes and lemons, I carried as many back as I could well stand under. When I came home from this journey, I contemplated with great pleasure the fruitfulness of that valley and the pleasantness of the situation, the security from storms on that side of the water and the wood, and concluded that I had pitched upon a place to fix my abode, which was by far the worst part of the country. Upon the whole, I began to consider of removing my habitation and looking out for a place equally safe as where now I was situated, if possible, in that pleasant, fruitful part of the island. This thought ran long in my head, and I was exceeding fond of it for some time. The pleasantness of the place tempted me, but when I came to a nearer view of it, I considered that I was now by the seaside, where it was at least possible that something might happen to my advantage and, by the same ill fate that brought me hither, might bring some other unhappy wretches to the same place. And though it was scarce probable that any such thing should ever happen, yet to enclose myself among the hills and woods in the center of the island was to anticipate my bondage and to render such an affair not only improbable, but impossible, and that, therefore, I ought not by any means to remove." However, I was so enamored of this place that I spent much of my time there for the whole of the remaining part of the month of July. And though, upon second thoughts, I resolved not to remove, yet I built me a little kind of a bower, and surrounded it at a distance with a strong fence, being a double hedge as high as I could reach, well stocked and filled between the brushwood, and here I lay very secure, sometimes two or three nights together, always going over it with a ladder, so that I fancied now I had my country house and my seacoast house, and this work took me up to the beginning of August. I had but newly finished my fence and began to enjoy my labor when the rains came on and made me stick close to my first habitation, for though I had made me a tent like the other with a piece of a cell and spread it very well, 
Yet I had not the shelter of a hill to keep me from the storms, nor a cave behind me to retreat into when the rains were extraordinary. About the beginning of August, as I said, I had finished my bower and began to enjoy myself. The 3rd of August, I found the grapes I had hung up perfectly dried and, indeed, were excellent good raisins of the sun. So I began to take them down from the trees, and it was very happy that I did so, for the rains which followed would have spoiled them, and I had lost the best part of my winter food, for I had above two hundred large bunches of them. No sooner had I taken them all down and carried the most of them home to my cave than it began to rain, and from hence, which was the 14th of August, it rained more or less every day to the middle of October, and sometimes so violently that I could not stir out of my cave for several days. In this season, I was much surprised with the increase of my family. I had been concerned for the loss of one of my cats, who ran away from me, or, as I thought, had been dead, and I heard no more tiding of her till, to my astonishment, she came home about the end of August with three kittens. This was the more strange to me, because, though I had killed a wild cat, as I called it, with my gun, yet I thought it was quite a different kind from a European cat's. But the young cats were the same kind of housebreed as the older one, and both my cats being females, I thought it very strange. But from these three cats I afterwards came to be so pestered with cats that I was forced to kill them like vermin or wild beast, and to drive them from my house as much as possible. From the 14th of August to the 26th, incessant rain, so that I could not stir, and was now very careful not to be much wet. In this confinement, I began to be straitened for food, but venturing out twice, I one day killed a goat, and the last day, which was the 26th, found a very large tortoise, which was a treat to me and my food was regulated thus. I ate a bunch of raisins for my breakfast, a piece of the goat's flesh or of the turtle for my dinner, broiled, for, to my great misfortune, I had no vessel to boil or stew anything, and two or three of the turtle eggs for my supper. During this confinement in my cover by the rain, I worked daily two or three hours at enlarging my cave, and by degrees worked it on towards one side, till I came to the outside of the hill, and made a door or way out, which came beyond my fence or wall, and so I came in and out this way. But I was not perfectly easy at lying so open, for, as I had managed myself before, I was in a perfect enclosure, whereas now I thought I lay exposed, and open for anything to come in upon me. And yet I could not perceive that there was any living thing to fear." the biggest creature that I had yet seen upon the island being a goat. September 30th. I was now come to the unhappy anniversary of my landing. I cast up the notches on my post and found I had been on shore 365 days. I kept this day as a solemn fast, setting it apart for religious exercise, prostrating myself on the ground with the most serious humiliation, confessing my sins to God acknowledging his righteous judgment upon me, and praying to him to have mercy on me through Jesus Christ, and not having tasted the least refreshment for twelve hours, even till the going down of the sun, I then ate a biscuit cake and a bunch of grapes and went to bed, finishing the day as I began it. I had all this time observed no Sabbath day, for as at first I had no sense of religion upon my mind, I had, after some time, omitted to distinguish the weeks by making a longer notch than ordinary for the Sabbath day, and so did not really know what any of the days wore. But now, having cast up the days as above, I found I had been there a year, so I divided it into weeks and set apart every seventh day for a Sabbath, though I found at the end of my account I had lost a day or two in my reckoning. A little after this, my ink began to fail me, and so I contented myself to use it more sparingly, and to write down only the most remarkable events of my life, without continuing a daily memorandum of other things. 
The rainy season and dry season began now to appear regularly.